Right, let's crack on with the show, which this week is all about future technology. Yeah, there's no doubt that technology is moving at a pace, and mobile technology is no exception. Absolutely. Two of the major networks right now are trialling the next big thing, 4G, which, in simple terms, is faster than broadband speed in your pocket. The question is, is 4G good enough? I blowing hope so. So do I. <laughs> Accessing the internet on the go, as indispensable as it has become, can be a bit like the weather, unpredictable. Poor coverage, slow speeds, signal dropping out. It's so frustrating. At the moment, the very best mobile internet can offer us comes from the 3G network, a patchwork infrastructure that delivers blisteringly average speeds of 2.1 megabits per second. Is it any wonder that we're pulling our hair out? If you're wondering, is it ever going to get any better than this? Well, you're in luck, because I am going to be taking a trip into the future to see how we'll be accessing our data on the move in years to come. Not that far into the future. Only to the year 2013, in fact. I'd been lucky enough to bag myself a day on O2's new 4G network, which they are currently trialling in central London. I've got my hands on a bunch of mobile gadgets, the kind of which we use on a daily basis, and they're all designed to access data very, very quickly, but sometimes it's the network that lets them down. Gadgets like mobiles, dongles and personal hotspots are typically used as an emergency connection by most of us, maybe just for Googling, tweeting or emailing on the move. That's because when it comes to downloading big files or streaming movies, 3G isn't much cop. Hey. Stop buffering me! But come 2013, when O2 and the other networks complete a total telecommunications revamp of the United Kingdom, things could be very different. Right, I am set to do this test. I've got my dongle plugged in here. Look, look, 4G, remember, so it promises to be much, much faster than the 3G that we're used to. Now, we're all familiar with the somewhat lacklustre speed test results we get from our home and mobile networks, but how would 4G fare? This is the future. What's it going to be? Is it going to be impressive? In three, two... Wow, look at that. It was a staggering speed of 87.39 megabits per second. That's a whopping 45 times faster than the current average 3G speed. That's extraordinary. But how is this possible? Mobile data reaches us via the radio wave spectrum, much like TV and radio signals do. Imagine this spectrum is like a road with cars representing packets of data moving towards their destination. Currently, 3G could be represented okay. as a single track road, whereas 4G is similar to a motorway. More lanes means more data. Not only that, but packets of 4G data are able to travel closer together than they can with 3G. Therefore, the combination of a wider road and closer cars result in more data per okay. second on our mobile devices. And you won't just get 4G in the big cities. When the old analogue TV signal is switched off in 2012, that spectrum will be used to help provide those in remote rural areas with super-fast connections as well. But how would 4G stack up in the real world? I decided to put it up against its predecessor 3G in three quick-fire tests. This is a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot, which should enable my mobile phone to pick up the 4G signal. So with the hotspot up and running, it was time for a mobile showdown, starting with the Gadget Show's website. Go! And from the off, 4G appeared to be giving the opposition something of a hiding. 4G wins. Again, accessing 4G via Wi-Fi hotspots. This time, I wanted to push the capabilities of 4G further with an HD YouTube clip. In three, two, one. Got my movie coming in right now. Already in with the 4G, just come down with the 3G. The 4G connection enabled noticeably faster loading, but there was a bigger difference. Clearly, with the 3G, it can't quite cope with the HD, and it's being slightly compressed, so you get this slightly fuzzy image, whereas with 4G, the HD image is clear and the clarity is excellent, just as it should be. The theoretical maximum speed of 4G is 1 gigabit per second. These speeds, a 1.2 gigabyte full HD film, should, theoretically, take less than 15 seconds to download. Astonishing! Finally, laptops, and for this, I had something totally unique set up. 
I am about to attempt something that nobody in the history of video gaming has ever attempted before, probably. I am going to play a full-on gaming blockbuster right here in the middle of Marvelots. The plan was to stream gaming title Deus Ex onto my laptop via the cloud-based service on Live, which on a regular 3G dongle is considered foolhardy to say the least. But on the laptop using 4G, something truly awesome was happening. I cannot believe that I am playing this game sitting here in Marvel Arch. These are graphics that you would expect to see on your home console. And they're being streamed now via the cloud. It's fantastic. And without a glitch or buffer in sight, something 3G could only dream of. It's working perfectly. This is just extraordinary. So it looks like proper internet on the move, capable of handling whatever we throw at it, is soon to become a reality. And it looks like it's game over for 3G. Mm, 4G, guys, do you want it? I yeah. need it now. Yes. <laughs> I'm very excited about it, but why do we have to wait till 2013? Well, because we're squeezing the last bejeebus out of 3G, <laughs> and of course the infrastructure rollout is huge, so we have to wait till 2013, maybe even the end of them. They did pay a lot of money, the uh, you know, all the telcos for 3G. Yeah. They've got to make it work financially, but if it's done properly, it means that when it arrives, it should work, and that's yeah. also very important, because only now are we getting to a point where 3G is actually reliable. It certainly is a metropolitan area, as I can't speak for living in the countryside. Yeah, well, I, can. I can, because where I live, just outside London, has appalling broadband. Um, and I would have to wait until fibre optic cabling is rolled out, but 4G might You're be get an this exciting, quicker. Exciting. And, and let's not think, we're used to thinking that broadband's the quickest alternative. It might flip. Although 4G will have to deliver on those promises, and I hope it won't be like 3G, where as soon as everyone starts using it, you know, it all seizes up and becomes yeah. hopeless. Mm. Yeah. The great thing is we're mm. going to find out, aren't we? Yeah, mm. very shortly. Welcome back. Now I want to talk to you about the development of technology within the military, and in particular, the Eurofighter Typhoon. Pilots of Typhoons are now using some revolutionary and astounding new technology whilst they fly. And to find out more about it, I headed off to their secret test centre to take a look for myself. I was told to report to a facility operated by BAE Systems. It's not a military establishment. It's got its very own fighter base. It's packed with military hardware, including the ultimate gadget, its very own fighter jet. Thank you very much. The Eurofighter Typhoon. Capable of flying the distance from London to Paris in only eight minutes and worth an eye-watering £60 million, BAE are constantly testing and updating the Typhoon's technology to keep it at the pinnacle of agility and safety for its pilots. And I was soon to discover the incredible tech that I'd be testing when I met up with Chief Test Pilot Mark Bowman. It's the uh, Eurofighter helmet-mounted uh, display, cutting-edge bit of kit, a little bit like Star Wars meets uh, the present day. Can't wait! Now, a helmet may not sound very exciting, but this was no ordinary skid lid. Well, John, here it is. Oh, gosh. It's a new super helmet that taps into the aircraft's computerised brain, allowing the pilot to lock onto targets by turning his or her head in their direction. With conventional systems, the pilot has to point the plane in the direction of the target to get it in their line of sight. That leaves the plane exposed to attacks from other directions. With this new system, it's the helmet that does the pointing, and no time is wasted having to manoeuvre the aircraft. If we know where the pilot's head is, and we can integrate the pilot very closely with the aeroplane, we can use now the pilot's head to steer all those clever sensors that the Eurofighter Typhoon has. Sensors on the Typhoon identify the location of enemy planes and feed this information back to the helmet. This gives pilots an unparalleled virtual view of what's going on around them in all directions at once using the display on the inside of the visor. So you don't have to actually see your adversaries somehow? This well, is... this is very clever as well. You can see through the floor of the aircraft as well, which again, it's all about tactical advantage, not just the safety of the system, but we really want to make sure that today's fighter pilots are, are in the, uh, the strongest possible uh, position to win that fight. But if I was going to experience it for myself, I'd need a quick crash course in jet fighting. And I hope the emphasis wouldn't be on the word crash. Well, first of all, John, though, welcome to my office. Just very quickly, just a couple of uh, key areas, really. Your uh, right hand would be on the, uh, the stick there, yep. and your left hand would be on the throttle. And you'll see on each side of you here some electronics which actually track the position of the pilot's helmet. There's also one uh, behind them, indeed so. 
The conventional heads-up display is still there, but becomes redundant when the super helmet visor comes into play. What you need to do now is uh, get the helmet on and let's go and uh, fly a mission. Why in this? Well, obviously there's a simulator. I mean, this would be a... <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. I should. I, I hate that you were going to say that. Not because it wouldn't be absolutely thrilling, but I'm sure I would crash before I got it out of be, the. It would be more than my jobs were <laughs> to let you go, John. But I'm sure you're the more than capable. No, I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> Relief. Thankfully, there was a Typhoon active cockpit simulator at my disposal. After a little intensive tuition from Mark. Undercarriage up, yeah. and then just keep climbing a bit. And then what I want to do is just roll slightly to the right. I was airborne and on the lookout for targets. Because the helmet is classified military technology, we can't show you exactly what the pilot sees, but the screenshots on the simulator give a very good idea of the way the display works. And you can already see in the helmet now, looking left and right, the Ooh. panoramic view you've got there of all those uh, targets Ooh. out there. The enemy targets themselves were barely visible to the naked eye, but once highlighted in green diamonds, were easy to pinpoint. As soon as I turned my head towards one of the aggressors, the helmet showed my crosshair sight with a circle in the centre, meaning I'd locked on, without me having to touch the aircraft's controls. Firing now! No sooner had I dealt with that blighter than I was confronted by another. Not having to turn the aircraft saved valuable seconds and gave me the upper hand. Firing now! It was easy to see how this technology could be crucial in a combat situation. I was feeling very pleased with myself. I got airborne and taken out a couple of targets. Now it was time to land. But it wasn't as easy coming down as it was going up. Not easy at all. Ah! And you're down. We're down. You've what run. do I need to do next? Brake. Where's, where's the brake? On the foot brakes. No! <laughs> We're in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, John, lucky you. That I mean, was absolutely was fascinating. Fun. It was huge fun, yeah. Yeah. Now, I know that they use um, head up in, obviously, the military, space exploration, diving, things mm. like that, but how do you think it could be used, you know, for a common consumer like myself? Well, I think if it was to get smaller and to react with special glasses or contact lenses, it would be very useful when you're driving. You could get rid of blind spots in cars and trucks. You could see a parking space, look at it and say, I want to park there, the car takes over do and does you, it. Yeah. And uh, also sat-nav, it could be useful with that. Really could. Yeah. Oh, you know what else would be really good for? Bikers, mm. helmet, extra vision. Watch Excellent. the space. Yeah. Now, if you missed our look into the future of tech, don't worry, as you can watch it all on our website. And if that's not enough, for even more future tech knowledge, take a look at what could be the ultimate future of gaming. As the Gadget Show Web TV recently got to experience iAsteroids, the world's first arcade game you control with just your eyes. So head to channel5.com slash gadget show now for a genuinely eye-opening experience and immerse yourself in the future. Right, next up, time for a bit of future tech that may be not as far away as you might think. I've been to look at the latest developments in transport, surveillance and security tech. And this tech may play a very big part in our lives in the very near future. We all know the technological world moves fast, but what are the latest amazing advances? There are numerous projects right on our doorstep that we think will change the way we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. First on my agenda was transport. Could how we get from A to B be about to change? Thanks to a project started at Bristol University and developed by British firm Ultra, Heathrow Airport is setting the mould with this. Known as pod cars, these clever bits of tech aren't just eco-friendly, they're completely driverless. Heathrow is currently using 21 of these vehicles that can carry up to four passengers and their luggage along a dedicated 3.8km guide track, travelling at speeds of up to 40km per hour. They recharge their own batteries and they stay on the track using a laser guidance system. Unlike other current public transport, you can program your pod to take you directly to where you want to go and it won't stop en route to pick up anyone else. So, great stuff if you're a frequent flyer, but where is this future tech headed? To find out, I hitched a ride with one of Ultra's developers, Adam Ruddle. Well, we're looking at all sorts of opportunities. In particular, we're looking at city centres where there's so much congestion with all the traffic trying to get in and out. And what we're looking at is using systems like this to take people out of their cars mm -hmm. so they can get around a city centre in a pod without uh, adding to the congestion that's already there. Everything else in the world is computerised now, why not transportation? 
So the driver could soon be a thing of the past. But that's not the only area where automation could soon take over. The next stop on my journey was to Omni Perception in Cambridge, where I was hoping to get a peek at the future of security tech. This is Checkpoint S, a next generation identification system that's bringing science fiction to life. So Charles, what is Checkpoint S? It is a covert or overt surveillance system. Mm -hmm. um, it uses a sensor like this and it will recognise a person as they walk past the camera and it will alert in real time as to their presence. The Checkpoint S camera identifies you by bouncing light off your face to detect your unique facial features. Software then matches these features with photographs stored in its database. And now, if you walk past our sensor, mm -hmm. it will ping up and it will let us know that you're here. While still only in prototype form, the system managed to identify me with only a fleeting glance. So this would be really handy, say, if it was in my favourite shops. Yes, yes. So I could walk in and they'd know that I'd arrived yes. and they, they could kind of treat me according, yeah. <laughs> in the future, we could see this being used everywhere, from passport checks at airports to clocking us in at work. And not only will Big Brother be watching us, he'll know exactly who we are. My final glimpse into the future has been developed firmly with the military in mind. We've seen flying drones on the Gadget Show before, but the SQ-4 is the smallest and lightest yet. It has two cameras on here that send a direct feed to the goggles that you wear, and it's small enough to fit in your backpack. Designed by Middlesex University to recce danger zones, this RC air vehicle can reach heights of 400 feet and can quietly hover or even perch on objects. You can imagine how great this will be in the right environment when you need to see what's around the corner without actually being able to do it in person. This bit of tech will just be outstanding. Onboard cameras simultaneously record and transmit pictures to the pilot's goggles from up to 600 metres away. And the clarity through the goggles as well is very, very defined. Which could potentially give soldiers a tactical advantage over the enemy. <laughs> How was that? That was great. I managed to land it in one piece, which is rare. I love the idea and the technology is fantastic. But where do you see this technology going? We want to actually make it smaller. So, I mean, the soldier right now, he's burdened with so much weight on his backpack. We want to reduce that weight even more. We're actually working on smaller prototypes and we want every soldier to have one in his backpack. Military interest in RC gadgets has grown enormously in recent years. And from what I've seen, I believe that the SQ-4 could soon become a standard part of every soldier's kit. Welcome back. Now it's time for some infamous Bradbury future gazing. I know you're going to love this. I've been doing my research and I've come up with what I think are some of the game-changing and just plain most futuristic concepts that you're going to be able to experience, not in a few years' time, but as soon as 2012. Check these out. This year has seen some of the most amazing tech. It would have been the stuff of gadget fantasy in mere months, let alone years ago. But where can we feasibly go from here? We've got loads of shiny new tablets. We can game anywhere and everywhere. We've even realised our three-dimensional dreams. What can 2012 possibly offer us that we haven't already got? Well, thankfully, it looks like the tech giants of this world are going to be making sure we're all still spending, with all of them lining up to release some of their most ambitious and amazing inventions yet. And still making its mark in 2012 is 3D TV. But with sets like these, you can ditch these and still get your 3D <laughs> on. Yep, in 2012, glasses free, 3D is finally here. It's been the talk of the town for years now, but never seemed to materialise. But with the likes of the Toshiba ZL2 hitting the shelves in 2012, they're hoping to keep 3D well on top of the gadget agenda. That is going to take 3D viewing in the home to the next level. And it's not just the third dimension that's changing the shape of TV. Super high vision is on the 2012 horizon, which will give us an amazing resolution that is four times the quality of conventional HD. And this Sony projector is going to be the first on the market to utilise the tech. And with trial recordings taking place at next year's Olympics, it's not going to be long before this state-of-the-art footage hits a living room near you. One of the gadgets due out in 2012 that I'm most excited about is this Sony's PS Vita. Look at that lovely widescreen, capable of delivering lush visuals that really are unparalleled in pocket-sized gaming, and a dual touchscreen interface that is absolutely bleeding edge. The Vita is due in February, with over 20 titles available at launch, from Resistance Burning Skies to FIFA. I'm coming from a time when, you know, I was playing 8-bit games on a computer, 
and I was loading them off a cassette, and this is where we are now. I mean, look at this thing. It's going head-to-head -head with the relatively unsuccessful 3DS and hopes to capture the imagination of gamers with its ultra power and usability, rather than pop out 3D visuals. But it's not just handheld consoles like the PS Vita that are going to get gamers salivating in 2012, with Goliath titles such as Max Payne 3, Grand Theft Auto 5 and Halo 4 due out, there's plenty for pixel freaks like me to get extremely excited about. And the console we play our games on is also set to change, with brand new hardware in the shape of Wii U during the second half of next year. With a tablet rather than a joypad to control the games, it really does bring a unique proposition to playing the latest titles. But it doesn't look like Sony or Microsoft want to be left out in the cold, as there are strong rumours that come next year, both will announce their own next-generation consoles. So, we'll have to watch this 2012 space. If there's one thing sure about technology, it's that it gets exponentially smaller every year. And if in 2012 you're in the market for a laptop, then you might be interested in these slimline sensations, otherwise known as Ultrabooks. These machines are sleek, powerful, and have a battery life of up to 10 hours, and the 2012 market is going to be flooded with them. But it's not just the machines that are about to change. Microsoft are due to launch their latest operating system, Windows 8. It'll work on conventional computers, but it'll also work on tablets. Windows 8 brings together the best of their desktop, laptop and tablet services and combines them in one operating system that is compatible with all the devices. You'll better use it on touchscreen devices like this, your big TV screen at home, and there are even rumours that there are touchscreen ultrabooks on their way. And this is where it gets really interesting. With Windows 8, Android and this Kindle's Fire all due out in the new year, Apple's dominance at the top of the tablet tree looks seriously threatened. And I, for one, can't wait for the fight to begin. And the fight back will kick off with more and more powerful tablets running Android's brand new operating system, Ice Cream Sandwich, such as the Transformer Prime from Asus. But it's this. The Kindle Fire that should have Apple quaking in their boots. It's not the most powerful full-colour tablet, but it's due to come in at well under £200, and that fact alone should smash open the tablet market in 2012. Due to launch in the UK at some point next year, it comes with all the standard Kindle reading features, with the bonus of apps, videos and music. But of course, Apple won't be resting on their laurels. They're said to be hard at work on their third-generation iPad, but will it be enough to fend off the fierce competition? Only a crystal ball tuned to 2012 will tell. So, is 2012 going to be the best year for tech yet? I'd definitely say it's a contender. I love the glasses-free 3D TV. Yeah, I know. It's uh, astonishing technology. How does it compare to, say, like the Nintendo 3DS? It's slightly different. It sits somewhere between coming out at you and going in. It, it feels like a very glorious, high-resolution image that has something about it that looks more organic than your normal television. It's going to be big business. I'm really excited about seeing that. Talking about big business, though, uh -huh. this thing, the Kindle Fire, which I have is, to touch that. I think this has... This has the ability to be the gadget of 2012. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so simple in its design. I mean, there's nothing fussy about it, but it's been done so well. Well, that's why it's cheap, in effect. It is a very straightforward piece of kit that does what it says on the tin. I'm loving it. Can I keep it, Jase? Oh, go on then. Oh, thanks, Jace. Now, if you've ever been to a gadget show live, you may have seen the beautiful robotic penguins. Well, the company that brought you those robotic animals and others, Festo, have unveiled their latest technological development. So, I hopped on a plane to Germany to go and have a look at it myself. This wasn't the first time that the gadget show had visited Festo to marvel at tech innovations inspired by living animals. A few series ago, Otis was introduced to some very lifelike robotic penguins that navigated using sonar just like the real thing. I'm having so much fun with them, I'd almost forgotten they're mechanical. And we were blown away by the company's intelligent jellyfish robots working together in a giant tank and a spin-off design that floated elegantly in the air. But we're back again because I've been told about two new developments that I can't wait to see. Festo and its partners in the Bionic Learning Network invent novel technology with the aim of using their designs to improve industrial processes. And their inspiration? If you hadn't already guessed, natural animal systems that evolution has spent millions of years perfecting.
Like the first innovation I've come to see, a robotic copy of an elephant's trunk. It's called the Bionic Handling Assistant. Look how flexible that is. And it's designed to pick up fragile objects with precision, just like Jumbo's trunk. Oh, all right then. OK, where are you going? The arm is manoeuvred by pumping compressed air into polymer chambers, which make up its core. These can all expand and contract independently of each other, and as a result, the trunk can move in any direction. There's air going through this chamber here, but no air going through these, which is That's why right. the arm bends. And the arm has adaptive grippers, actually based on a fish's fin. But the most important aspect of the design is that the handling assistant's movement is very gentle, so it is safe to work hand in hand with humans. So how is this different then? We're making it as light as possible. That really does mean that if we get in this way, it, we can push back against it. And if you're working alongside a robot like this, it would do you no harm whatsoever. OK, so if you've got plans on becoming a super strong bionic supervillain, the handling assistant might not be the answer. But if you just need a helpful hand, this could be the tech for you. Now, the elephant trunk was impressive. However, I've been told about an innovation that I am very, very excited about. This is the smart bird, the result of years of dedicated research into achieving one goal, to create a machine that can fly like a bird. Its development has combined Festo's knowledge of engineering, computing and aerodynamics, and it certainly looks the part. But would it really fly? <laughs> Unbelievable. And it's even moving its head. Scientists thought this was impossible. But the battery-powered Smartbird has copied the exact aerodynamics of a herring gull and achieved the miracle of robotic flight. That is beautiful. This energy-efficient flying machine has an ultralight carbon fibre skeleton and, incredibly, just one tiny engine making the wings flap. That's the engine? Yes, that's all. That, that little thing yes. is the engine. So, it can so that powers the whole bird? Yes, the whole bird. The elegant design combined with such mechanical precision were like something from the imagination of Leonardo da Vinci working alongside Jules Verne. But just look how fluid that joint and that movement is. The engineering master trick here was to create two types of simultaneous wing movement. Not only up and down, yeah. we have also the active torsion. So we've got the active torsion just Maybe. twisting to get, the, I guess, the most efficiency out of the, the flight. Yeah. So the wings provide lift and thrust. The head and torso move to keep everything balanced and the tail acts as a rudder. Though that's not to say that things always go smoothly. <laughs> the smart bird represents a new era in robotic flying tech. It's an aerodynamic triumph. But not having robot legs means the landing <laughs> sometimes be something of a problem. Look at that! Amazing. Oh, magic. It blows me away I every time. It. Really mesmerising watching that smart bird. I wanted to go away and come back with something in its beak. It was so real, wasn't <laughs> I it? I know, and the concepts that they have and everything that they've got into production at the moment and they're designing is just breathtaking. And they've sort of nailed a, a, ma a manufacturing technique, haven't they? Because yeah, they yeah. produce stuff very, very quickly. Yeah. Since you went, they they've, yeah. they've marched forward with yeah. their technology. It's oh, extraordinary. Yeah. I can't wait to see what they come up with next. Me neither. Mm. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Gadget Show, in which we'll be looking at the future of technology and trying to work out what it all means to the likes of you and me. Yes. Now, Jason has told us what gadgets to look out for in 2012. I've been looking at the latest developments in 4G. John's been looking at the technology in the military environment. And Polly went to the wonderful Festo to look at some animal-like robots. And now it's my turn, and I have been a busy boy. I've been looking at all the technologies that we enjoy taking advantage of now and seeing how we're going to be using them in the future. Everything you've seen on The Gadget Show over the past 16 series would have seemed like an impossible sci-fi dream just 50 years ago. But what impossibilities can we expect the next half century to hold? These are The Gadget Show's top five future predictions. At number five, the cashless society. 
On The Gadget Show, we've seen many examples of wireless payment schemes, such as London's Oyster Card. However, by 2015, we might not be using cash at all. That's because soon you'll be able to ditch all of this for one of these. Earlier this year, Orange unveiled their Quick Tap system. It uses a technology called Near Field Communication that lets your smartphone operate as a virtual credit or debit card. And what about PayPal's latest app, which allows you to pay your friends with just a quick bump of your phone? But it doesn't end there because we may soon be able to skip the checkout entirely by self-scanning products and paying for them directly using our handsets. And finally, Microsoft foresees a world without barcodes at all, with money transferred with just a snap of a photo. At number four, the Universal Translator. Services like Babelfish and more recently Word Lens have gone a long way to break down language barriers, but we still have the problem of, well, talking to one another. What we really want is that staple of science fiction, the Universal Translator. And it's not as far away as you might think. Google's recently updated Translate application for Android offers back and forth voice to voice translation between 14 different languages. And new app Vocray promises to go one further by adding basic phone call support to their translation app. Experts predict that by 2020, the need to learn a foreign language may no longer exist as 7 billion people sont rapprochés comme la traduction universelle devient la norme dans le téléphone mobile. Formidable. At number three, augmented reality glasses. At The Gadget Show, we love augmented reality, but we've always felt that viewing the world through the screen of a mobile is, well, a bit unnatural. But what if the screen wasn't in your hand, but directly in front of you through a pair of glasses? Imagine the possibilities of a world where the internet wasn't just a service, it was an entirely new dimension. Zeal Optics recently brought this dream a little closer to reality by announcing their Z3 Winter Sports goggles with integrated LCD dashboard. Meanwhile, video eyewear company Vuzix has already begun producing fully immersive AR glasses. And while it may be at least 15 years before the dream is fully realized, many people have created visual models of how our future would look including Keiichi Matsuda, who has designed everything from augmented reality cooking recipes to social networking. And filmmaker Freddie Wong, who has produced fully immersive gaming environments. At number two, the holographic TV. Whilst Jason is getting excited about the prospect of glasses-free 3D, I'm excited about the next, next big thing, holograms. Unlike conventional 3D, where all viewers observe the same image no matter where they're seated, holographic 3D video uses lasers to create images that appear to float in mid-air and provide a completely different perspective relative to your position. And virtual princess layers aren't as far off as you might imagine. Researchers at both MIT Media Lab and the University of Arizona are working on making holographic telepresence a reality, and it could be with us within the next 20 years. At number one, the artificial brain. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It powers your search engine, filters out your spam, and powers RoboJace. Yes, please. <laughs> but mankind has always dreamt bigger, and this year alone has seen some huge leaps in AI. From Audi demonstrating a fully autonomous, intelligent car capable of independent rally racing, to Honda's famous Asimo robot getting a new lease of independent thought and movement. And, most impressively, a supercomputer developed by IBM called Watson, who famously appeared on US TV game show Jeopardy and defeated two former champions in a general knowledge competition. Worst actress of the decade, what is Paris Hilton? Tweens can spend hours on this, what is Twitter? Its name sounds like a sharp cry, what is Yelp? Scientists believe that by studying the way the human mind learns and stores information, they will ultimately develop computers capable of seeing and understanding the world around us through machine learning. And by the year 2050, artificial intelligence may have reached a point known as the singularity, which is where we could see machines with intelligence greater than that of humans. After that, all bets are off. And that is the future, ladies and gentlemen. Am I the 
only person here who's just a little bit terrified of singularity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is quite uh, quite scary, isn't it? This Very notion scary. That but, it, but it's inevitable. There's nothing we can do. That's where we're going. As we yeah. march technologically forward, always getting more powerful, the silicon merging with biology, it's, there's Ooh, nothing we can down, do. Oh, slow it down, I think. There's nothing down. we can do. I think human intelligence is going to prove to be subtly different from artificial intelligence, and however powerful each is, that difference is going to save us. Oh, go I do hope you're right. <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> well, on that positive note, well, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.